Tonight I want to talk about the books of 2 Peter and Jude. We're doing a, a study on the book of, of Jude. But I think it's important tonight to understand that there's tremendous similarity uh, between 2 Peter and the book of Jude itself. Uh, 2 Peter and Jude are so similar, it looks like they were taken from the same backgrounds. But especially when you look at 2 Peter chapter 2, is very analogous to the book of, of Jude itself. Now with that being said, the authorship of 2 Peter has come under question throughout the centuries. Uh, many people think, well, Peter didn't seem like he wrote that because the style of 1 Peter is tremendously different than the style of the writing of 2 Peter itself. We must understand the New Testament canon of Scripture was formed with the basic rule that said, shall be written by an apostle or amnesis of the apostle. An amnesis is simply a secretary or someone that writes on behalf of, of someone else. With that being said, we also know the Council of Carthage said, nothing shall be read in the churches except the recognized canon. Uh, so the canon is simply a measuring rod uh, of test, if you will, to prove which, the book, which books of the Bible were inspired of God and which books of the Bible were not inspired of God. Uh, and it's called a canon, the scripture, a measuring rod. There were a number of pseudepigraphal books that were out there written around the same time. Uh, a lot of the uh, uh, particular books of the Apocrypha and things like that. Uh, they are in some of the Bibles, but they are not in the Christian Bible, the church, the, the church from the standpoint that they were written. They didn't pass the, the canon of Scripture. They didn't pass the test. Uh, they were written the wrong way. They were written out of date. They were written by wrong people. Uh, the stories contradict the Bible itself. So there's a variety of reasons why they were not placed in the canon of Scripture. But all 27 books of the New Testament are included in the New Testament, and that includes 2 Peter itself. Now understand, if you will, uh, 1 Peter was written eloquently. 1 Peter was written in a very beautiful way. The person uh, that, that wrote 1 Peter uh, knew the, the Greek language inside. I mean, they flowed. Uh, Greek just flowed out of them, if you will. It was beautiful and elegant the way that it was penned in the Greek language. But when you come to 2 Peter, it's written as if so somebody was writing it by looking at a Greek dictionary. So if Peter has his name to both of them, how do you explain the difference in, in style? Here it is. In 1 Peter was written by Sylvanius, who was the amnesis or the secretary uh, of Peter, and he was a brilliant when it came to the Greek language. Understand that when Peter accepted the Lord, he was an adult. He spoke Aramaic. So with that being said, Peter himself, who knew very little of the Greek language at all, uh, he tried to write the Greek language in 2 Peter, and that explains the difference between the style of writing in 1 Peter and the style of writing in 2 Peter. And we know that Peter wrote 2 Peter because he says uh, here in the Word of God in 2 Peter uh, chapter 3 and verse 1 that he himself wrote the book. The second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. Well, he may have got a Greek dictionary to do that, but he wrote it, okay? So 1 Peter, eloquently written by Sylvanius, the Amnesis. 2 Peter, written by poor old Peter, who knew Aramaic and probably had a Greek dictionary somewhere. Does that make sense? So that explains the difference between the style of the writing. Now, the central message of 2 Peter, once again, 2 Peter and the book of Jude are very analogous together. 2 Peter chapter 2 and Jude are very, very similar. That's why I think it's important that we look into 2 Peter to begin with. Now the central message of 2 Peter, the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord, according to His divine power, hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue. The main thought of 2 Peter and Jude is apostasy. Uh, falling away from the truth of God. Notice, if you will, uh, in 2 Peter, uh, th there's no mention of the Lord's death. There's no mention of the Lord's resurrection. There's no mention of the Lord's ascension. For that matter, there's no mention of prayer in 2 Peter either. It's all about apostasy. Peter, 2 Peter talks about apostasy is coming to the church, whereas Jude says apostasy is already in the church. 
Okay, with that being said. Now, the, the, the structure of the book. Uh, in chapter 1, 1 through 14, you see the great Christian uh, 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 graces. Uh, in chapter 1, 15 through 21, uh, you see here the authority of the scriptures. Then in chapters 2, we see the apostasy, or Peter's writing about false teachers of that day. And then in chapter 3, he's referring to the return of Jesus Christ. Now let's look at these Christian graces to begin with in chapters 1, 2 Peter 1, 1 through 14. There's a danger in the Christian life without growth. But there's also a danger of knowledge without practice. Friends, it's not the things I don't know that bother me as much as it is the things that I do know that I don't know what to do with. Are you with me? So again, there's a danger in the Christian life without growth. But there's also a greater danger of knowledge without practice. It's one thing to know the truth of God's Word. It's another thing to practice the truth of God's Word. And herein lies the problem. If we know the truth and we do not practice the truth and live the truth and guard the truth and protect the truth, we will compromise the truth and the integrity of God's Word, and that's how we can fall into apostasy. That's how we can fall into false doctrine. That's how we can fall into things that will bring the wrath of God up on you like ugly uh, on an ape. Now, with a like precious faith in verse 11 and precious promises in verse 4, the partakers of the divine nature can escape the corruption that is in this world through lust. I want you to let that sink in. If we have the precious faith and the precious promises, then the partakers of the divine nature, you and I, we can escape the corruption that's in this world through lusts. I don't know about you, but that ought to grease your wagon wheel. To know that even though that there's a great falling away, and the Bible said in the last day, there will be a great falling away from the truth. And think about this. When Peter was writing, he was also writing to people that had a knowledge of God, but they did not have the power of God working in them. If you think about it, he said the professing church would be full of lasciviousness and greedy and heady and high-minded and rebelling and drunkards. The list goes on and on. There's a big litany that's there. And they said, in other words, the church, the professing church, will look exactly like the world. And today, don't you think the world's getting churchy and the church is getting worldly? And yet the Bible said if we will take the precious promises of God and be partakers of the precious faith of God, we will have everything we need to escape the corruption that's in this world trying to get in the church and trying to get inside you and me. Does that make sense? Now, friends, I'm telling you, this won't, uh, it may not make you shout, but I pray to God it'll make you shine. Amen? So there are seven Christian graces added to faith that Peter talks about here. And this should be our way of life. Let's don't gloss over them too quickly. To faith, add virtue. And to virtue, add knowledge. And to knowledge, add temperance, which means what? Self-control. Remember the temperance movement from many, many years back? self-control, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, brotherly kindness, add charity, which means love. So if you and I will add those things to our faith, if we allow the Holy Spirit to develop that temperance, that self-control, that patience, that godliness, that brotherly kindness and that love, meaningful love, into our lives. Thank God we can be protected from the corruption of this world. I mentioned this in passing last week. Let me say it again. It comes to mind. If churches are teaching and showing love and they do not have the truth, that is cultish. But churches and Christian that have all truth and no love is selfish. Are you with me? It's just selfish. And there's got to be that balance there. Now, if these things be part of our life, we'll, be, we'll not be idle, we'll not be unfruitful in our knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says that in verse 8 as well. 
If we have this working in our lives, we will not be idle nor unfruitful in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. If we have faith and add all these seven virtues to it, he says, you will have something working in your life. It's not something we have to work up. It's something that's working in us and working through us on a day-by-day basis. Now, the Christian who becomes sterile forgets that he's been purged from his own nature. Friend, don't take salvation for granted. Don't take your walk with God for granted. Don't be like Samson of old and flirt with the world and flirt with this and flirt with that and say, well, I'll just shake myself like before and the power of God will be there, not knowing that God's power left. Samson got a haircut in the devil's barbershop. And too many times we might be getting haircuts in the devil's barbershop too, wondering what happened. Where did the power go? Where did the anointing go? Where did the love of God go? Look, if you announce the authority of Scriptures, verse chapter 1, verses 15 through 21. Now, the approaching death of Peter had to be upon his heart and upon his mind. His main teaching here is the fact the coming of Jesus Christ based upon his own eyewitness of the transformation, transfiguration rather, of Jesus Christ. Remember in Matthew, while he went up, spake, while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Peter, James, and John were taken upon the Mount of Transfiguration, and there the glory of God transfigured through him. And Peter said, won't we just build three tabernacles here, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah? Wouldn't it be great if we could just bottle this thing up? It doesn't work that way. But Peter saw that great transformation, transfiguration. So the Bible lets me know that verses 19 through 21 contains the most profound statements in the Word of God. He said, first of all, in verse 19, a more sure word of prophecy. More sure than Peter's eyewitness account of the transfiguration. Peter said, I saw that transfiguration, but I have a more sure word of prophecy that I know the Lord's coming back than what I saw with my own eyes. Does the coming of the Lord scare you or excite you? Let's be real. Does the coming of the Lord encourage you, excite you, or is there dread in it? We all want to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die to get there. But does it scare you? Uh, Let me tell you, I, I, I have no scientific facts on this. It's just my opinion. But I guarantee you, almost, if you went to any church in America and say, I know the Lord Jesus Christ for sure is coming back tomorrow. Are you ready to go? Yeah, but I don't want to. I've got this vacation planned. I've got this wedding I want to go to. I want to go to Disney World. I've got a good, there's, 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 there's a new rerun of Hogan's Heroes coming on tomorrow. I mean, what are the, who knows? But we're so earth-minded and we're so earth bound that we forget this is only transient we're passing through. The only time many Christians want to go to heaven is when all hell's breaking loose on your life on earth. And then there are times, oh Lord, just take me on out of here today. And then tomorrow gets better. I don't think I want to go, God. Am I being honest or not here? And yet we must understand according to what the Word of God says, we have a more sure word of prophecy. Peter said, I saw Jesus transfigured before me. I saw glory come down. And I know beyond that a more sure word of prophecy. That same Jesus is coming back for all of us. A more sure word of prophecy than what I had. He said, no prophecy of Scripture is of its own interpretation. And once again, People were saying the Lord is not coming. Peter said, yes, he is. Peter was also saying here, no prophecy of Scripture has its own interpretation. We must teach Scripture with Scripture. Scripture cannot mean today what it did not mean when it was written. And yet false teachers are ever on television, on YouTube, in pulpits of America. They're teaching and preaching what tickles the ear. And even though it goes beyond the integrity of God's Word, people are still flocking to it like ugly on an ape because it sounds good. And many people, let me tell you something, I can answer any question you ask me if you let me choose my own Scripture. It'll be wrong, but I can do it. Anytime you take a text out of context, you end up with a proof text. And a lot of people are preaching proof text today as if though it were the gospel. And crowds of people flock around them. 
know God's Word. Live God's Word. Judge life by God's Word. And friend, judge this preacher by God's Word. Are you with me? Many people are going to go to heaven or hell according to what a preacher tells them. Forgive me because many people are too lazy to read the book for themselves. So once again, keep it in context. Thirdly, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit in verse 21. Let me tell you this. Come on up here, honey, and preach for me. <laughs> Scripture takes precedent over man's ideas. Scripture takes authority over feeling. Scripture takes authority over teaching. Scripture takes authority over anything in this world. Somebody said, but pastor, I knew this person was living in adultery, but when he preached, God confirms it, so it must be of God. No. God can work through some people he cannot work in. God prophesied through a jackass, and that jackass was as lost as a ball in high weeds. Did he not? So God can work through people. That don't mean God puts his stamp of approval up on the vessel he uses. So let's take the authority. So again, he says here, these authority of God's word, a more sure word of prophecy, the Lord's coming. No prophet of the scripture has his own interpretation, and holy men of God spake as they were moved of the Holy Spirit. Now he comes up to the second chapter of 2 Peter, talking about apostasy. Apostasy, false teachers in the church. False prophets were heretics for the nation of Israel. Think about it. False prophets were heretics for the nation of Israel. And false teachers will also be in the church today denying the redemptive power of Jesus Christ the Lord. I'm going to say something to you. My opinion. We do not have to be twins to be brothers in the Lord. We can disagree agreeably on certain subjects. We understand that. Right? You get along with your spouse all the time? How many get along with your spouse all the time? Well, if you do, I want to talk to you because I'm going to tell you how not to, and that way you can make up and have some real fun. I don't know. I hear people all the time saying, but we, we never have an argument. Well, you made it something I'm not. Here's the point I want to try to get across. False teachers come in. False followers will go to false teachers. I was going to go somewhere with that, and it just slipped my mind. I looked at my wife, and she gave me that hairy eyeball. So, uh, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. It just went over my head. I forgot what I was going to bring up on that particular point. It might come back to me in a few minutes, I'm not sure. Uh, but anyway, false, the false prophets, the false prophets were heretics to Israel. False teachers shall be the church. And now, here's what I was going to say. I remember now. I can fellowship with people that believe the church is going to go through the great tribulation. I don't think we are, but if you do, I can fellowship with you. I can fellowship with people uh, that believe that once saved, you're always saved. I don't believe that, but if you do, I, I can have fellowship with you. I can fellowship with people that believe you baptize in Jesus' name only. I don't. Uh, I think uh, for my reasons on that, I believe you baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I have a reason for it biblically. But now when it comes to messing with the atonement of Jesus Christ, when it comes to messing with the deity of Jesus Christ, We've got to be in agreement on that. Because if we're not, we're messing with the foundation of everything the church of Jesus Christ believes in. Are you with me? So once again, we don't have to be twins to be brothers. There are many that are friends of mine that are in the apostolic faith are good people. But many of those same folk think that you've got to be baptized in the Holy Spirit with evidence speaking in tongues for you and go to heaven. I don't agree with that. But I can fellowship with them. It's not Jesus plus, it's Jesus period. Amen. And they want to add more to their doctrine, that's fine. I can, I can fellowship, but don't go messing with the deity of Christ. Don't go messing with the redemptive blood of Christ. Don't go messing with the things of Jesus, because if we do, we don't have a, nothing to stand upon. Now with that being said, false followers will go after false teachers. Paul lists three types of apostates, or Peter did, lists three types of apostates of the past who will appear in the future. Think about this. 
He, in, in verse 4, he mentioned angels who sinned. We'll get into that later on. But angels, they rebelled against God. He said people will enter the church that will boldly rebel against God in this last day. He's using the angels as an example. Secondly, the ungodly of Noah's day. Read about it in Matthew. Chapter 24, 37 through 39. The, and, and he said in the last days, people will just be like Noah. Marry and give them marriage. Nothing wrong with that. In other words, life goes on as if the world's fine, hunky dory. People are going to keep on living their life. But look what happened in Noah's day. People knew that judgment was coming, and they gave a death ear to it. And then when the judgment of God came, they were all crying out for mercy. Can you imagine when Noah and his sons and family got on that ark, and God shuts the door? They mocked him. They laughed at him for all those many, many years. And then all of a sudden... The water comes down from heaven, which they never seen rain before ever because the floods came up or the water came up from the ground. But for the first time, rain came down and the boat began to rise. Now they're banging on the door, let me in. It's too late. I was reminded, watching the news this past week over in Afghanistan when our military jets were ready to take off and people were hanging on, the ladders trying to get in for safety trying their best. I, I read somewhere this morning that some people have fallen out of the plane a thousand, two thousand feet in the air. Fall off, holding on, trying to think they can fly for safety because they were dreading what may await them when the Taliban takes over. And I thought to myself, can you imagine this is modern day, 21st century, people knocking on the door of that plane for safety. What's it going to be like when God's judgment comes upon an entire world just as it was in Noah's day? People will cry out, it's going to be too late at that time. And then he also talked about something else, angels who sin, rebellion against God, the ungodly of Noah's day. But he talked about immorality, like that of Sodom and Gomorrah. Dear Lord, you cannot turn the TV on anymore without seeing things that we years ago thought you'd never see on TV, even commercials. We are trying to make sin pleasurable. We advertise sin. We promote sin. We reward sin. We make stars out of people that are sinning. There are role models today, and we've, we, we've been seduced in the church, if we're not careful, to think it's okay when it's not. I'm not saying we start a crusade to condemn people who are in sin. The Lord didn't come to condemn. But we've got to start a crusade to see them saved. And that's one of the things that Peter was saying, in spite of the rebellion, in spite of the immorality that's wrong in this world, what does he say? Win the lost. When you look in Romans chapter 1, 24 through 32, you'll start seeing there that man started out knowing God. Man never lived in a cave going, ooh, 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 what's fire? Man started out with a knowledge of God. The Bible said so. He had enough sense to see there's a creation, therefore there is a creator. There is a design, therefore there is a designer. Who is this God? He made himself known. But because man refused to worship God, and man has to worship something, he began to worship something as big as God, and to him that's the world. And man began to worship the creation rather than worshiping God, the creator. Right? That's what the Bible said in Romans 1. And then since he doesn't have a God in which to give an account to, he can do anything he wants to do to anyone he wants to do with, and his conscience is clear. So he begins to live like the four-footed beast. He begins to throw caution to the wind. He begins to enter into all types of sin that's contrary to the will of God, the plan of God, and contrary to nature itself. And that's where homosexuality and immorality and, and all these other sins begin to come in. And you would think that people who would not retain the knowledge of God in their mind would be content for their own life. But you get down further in the book of Romans there, chapter 1, and you find out they want to drag other people into that same ungodly lifestyle. They're not happy to be content with their sin. They want to drag you and me and everybody else into it and say it's okay. Yeah. Brothers and sisters, this is where we live today. And these are the things that Peter in 2 Peter 2 was warning the church was coming. And we shall see if we get in the book of Jude. Jude says these things are already in the church. If they were in the church the day that Jude wrote, how much more are they in the church world even today? Well, once again, verse 7 said, The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. Praise God. 
The remainder of the chapter of two is vivid, but an awful description of apostasy. Angels will not presume to do such things in verse 11. The apostates or false teachers were like wild animals, he said. They're lustful, following Balaam for worldly gain, had a head knowledge. They're like hogs returning to the pig pen. Je Jesus had a lot to say about apostasy. Don't have time to read it, but Jesus had a lot to say about apostasy in both Matthew, also in Luke as well. The lesson for today, never allow compromise. I had that in font 20, but apparently it wouldn't fit on the screen. Never allow compromise. Friend, if Satan cannot beat you up and tear you down, the next thing he will try to do is get you and me to compromise. We'll compromise God's word. We'll compromise God's doctrine. We'll compromise any way we can. But you know why? It feels good to the flesh. It feels good to the flesh. I go down to the sheriff's department every Tuesday, Thursday morning, about 5.30 in the morning. And yesterday morning, I, I always try to have a little devotion with them, not anything long or laborious, but just to encourage them. And I went down the other morning, I said, guys, I said, I'm here because I care about you. I don't have your back because I can stab you in the back, but I want your heart. And I said, the thing today that came in my mind early this morning, riding up here, is three words. Everyone needs forgiveness. Everyone needs forgiveness. And I said, guys and gals, I said, I don't know where your stance is with God. I've talked to you enough about that already. But we all know by now that God can forgive us of things we've done wrong and things we've not done we should have done. He can forgive us of sins of commission and sins of omission. I said, but now how many times do we have difficulty forgiving ourselves? Forgiving ourselves for things we said or didn't say, should have said. And I said, now the issue is not between you and God, the issue is between you and yourself. We're all in need of forgiveness. And brothers and sisters, the world is in need of forgiveness. They don't need our slander. They don't need our condemnation. They don't need our holder than thou. They don't need all, any of that stuff. They need to know that we genuine care about the lostness of their soul. And the world could care less about how much we know until they know how much we care. And if all we have is what we do inside here, in these rooms, they don't think we care a whole lot. It's a Christian gospel ship. We're sailing to glory, shouting all the way, hoping the waves don't hurt us. No, out there, they're being killed daily. Yeah. But if we'll maintain that pure doctrine and that pure integrity before God and do as Peter tells us here, don't allow compromise to come in our classrooms, in our pulpits. Don't allow compromise to come into our homes, into our music, into whatever it is. Don't allow that compromise we can make a difference in this world. And then Peter talks about the return of Jesus. Peter wrote this letter in verse 1, 3, 1, to cause them to remember that the last day scoffers would be present, ridicule the second coming of Jesus Christ the Lord. They say nothing's changed since creation. I've been hearing the Lord's coming back all these years. He's not come back. He's not going to come back, blah, 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 blah. But again, as it was in the days of Noah, were so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. They mock it. They laugh at it. They make fun of it. But hear me, church, he is coming again. Now, the Bible does not teach three comings of Jesus. The Bible teaches two comings of Jesus. The first coming, Jesus came to this earth as a babe in Bethlehem's manger. The second coming will be in two phases. The first phase of the second coming, Jesus will come in the clouds, never touch the earth. That's the first phase of the, of the second coming, where you and I will be caught up, the dead in Christ will be caught up together, we'll meet the Lord in the clouds, and so shall we forever be with the Lord. Seven years after that, the great tribulation upon the earth, seven years after that, we will come back to this earth with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the scripture says. That's the second phase of the second coming.
But chapter 3 and verse 10 gives a vivid description of the destruction of this earth after the millennial reign of Christ. The Bible talked about heaven will pass away with great noise. When the Bible talks about passing away, that does not mean that it will be burnt up completely or annihilated. It doesn't, the Greek word here is not annihilation, more so like a renovation. If you watch somebody, you're at the airport and you watch an airplane take off, and they could pay me to do that, by the way, and that airplane takes off and you're watching and you're squinching and that airplane disappears, it's passed away. It's not annihilated, it's just passed away, right? And this is what it means to pass away here. Not annihilation, but it changes one form to another. We are going to live forever as Christians on this earth, the new heaven, the new earth. The holy city of Jerusalem will come down to the new earth. Everything that sin has touched, including heaven, has got to be somehow eradicated, uh, 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 melt away the elements dissolve, he said here. Heaven pass away with a great noise. Elements, all material on this earth. Does that mean, does that describe a nuclear bomb going off? Does that describe a meteorite hitting our planet? I don't know how God will do it, but everything will be melted. It will take one form over into another. And the Bible talked about fervent heat. You're talking about the judgment upon the earth. He says here, heaven pass away with a great noise. Elements, all material on the earth and fervent heat. That's energy. So in view of these facts of Scripture about the future, we should be serious and set ourselves apart for Jesus Christ, winning the lost. And the Bible said in verse 13, Now we, according to His promise, look for, what? Look for a new heaven and a new earth, wherein dwelleth Satan? No. Sin? No. Righteousness. Amen. Praise God. This world is not my resting place. I am not a citizen of earth going to heaven. I am a citizen of heaven passing through this old earth. And by the grace of God, we're going to make it. He said in verse 18, but grow in knowledge. And we grow only through the word of God. Amen. Let me hurry and try to get through Jude's introduction if you can real quick. We know that Jude was the brother of James. James was the pastor of the church in Jerusalem. James and Jude were half-brothers of Jesus Christ. We know that James and Jude were not Christians. They did not believe in Jesus Christ until after Jesus died on the cross and rose from the grave. Somewhere between Christ's resurrection and his ascension, they became believers in their half-brother as being their Lord and their Savior. We know that because they were in the upper room and they were awaiting the baptism in the Holy Spirit of which they in turn were saved and they received the precious baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Now when you read in the Word of God about um, uh, uh, Jude uh, or Judas in the book of Acts, that Judas and Jude here are one and the same. Not to be confused with the Judas uh, that hung himself, but Judas is, is the Jude here uh, in, in the book of Acts that received the Holy Spirit. Jude is the only book devoted entirely to the, apo the apostasy, which is to come upon Christianity before the Lord comes back to this earth to receive his saints. Jude brings all the teachings of apostasy in the Bible to a climax. He goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. He talks all the way through the people of Israel and brings it up to the present day uh, in which we are living as well. Now the book is very similar to 2 Peter once again. 2 Peter chapter 2, he saw the apostates coming to the church. Jude in all of his verses see the apostates already in the church. The central message, you should earnestly contend or strive for the faith which was once delivered to all states. Now, again, it's a small book, but the structure of the book, why should we strive for the faith? And the second thing is, how can we contend for the faith? First of all, why should we strive for the faith? In verses 3 through 16, uh, we see the apostate teachers creeping into the fold unnoticed. Think about that. False teachers coming into the church unnoticed. I have never, in this last few years, I received more phone calls than I ever had before of people wanting to come to preach. They, they, I've got this message to share. Well, who are you? Well, blah, blah, blah. And something just doesn't ring true. And I remember years ago, a lady came to the church early one morning. She said, the Lord sent me here to preach this morning. The pastor said, well, I'm the pastor of the church. 
And the Lord hasn't told me anything about it. So until he does, you can join us in the service, but you're not preaching I am. Well, she got mad. Well, you know, if you're not careful, you feelings can, you can say, well, I do the right thing because we're so compassionate toward people. But when it comes to God's word, no's no. Amen. And until I know those that labor among you. But I had a guy some time ago, he got to live with me because I, he was a so, so-called ex-football star and he had all this going for him. I said, Look, dude, I'm sorry. Uh, I haven't heard from God on this. I can pray. And boy, he let me have it. Well, guess what? He ain't coming. I don't care who he is. He's not coming. And I, I get calls all the time of pressure, pressure. I want to come. Want, why? And I'll tell you something else. A lot of the people today, they don't want to come and help you as a people. They want to come for an offering. That's just a side bar on that. Say amen, Pastor. <laughs> they hold two basic denials of faith. Turning the grace of God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what many of the false teachers would do in this last day. Now, the certain doom on false teachers, verses 5 through 7, foretold and is illustrated by three historical examples of apostasy from the past. He talked about Egypt. They were destroyed because they did not believe. Now, again, he's pulling history back, Jews all, all the way back to the Garden of Eden, about the history of the nation of Israel to present days. He's bringing all apostasy to a climax. So he uses Egypt as an example. Then he uses angels in verse 6. Those that did not keep their first estate, they are now preserved, reserved in chains, awaiting the judgment of God. We'll talk about that later. And then Sodom and Gomorrah, he talked about them. They're set forth as an example. Ungodly living, sinning, thinking God will wink at it, thinking God is... You know, we've heard, you've heard me say it many times. American churches, by and large, many of us, many of them, we have created this God in our own image. And we think that we have this, me and Jesus got our own thing going. He excuses my rebellion. He excuses my sin. He excuses my drinking, my gambling, my pornography. He excuses all of those things. Because we're buddies. But then, when trouble comes, I call upon the real God. The nation of Israel did that all throughout their history. And I hear more people, you'd be surprised the people I run into almost on a daily basis. You talk to them about the Lord, they're taking God's name in vain. You talk to them about, oh, I love Jesus. High on drugs. I pray to the Lord today, oh, he's so good. There's something wrong. If we've deceived ourselves in thinking we have a relationship with God and we're living in blatant sin, that is contradicting the Word of God and there's deception going on somewhere. And we can't stand before the judgment bar of God. You say, well, Pastor, you're not my judge. No, I'm not. But the book is. Amen. And if it walks like a duck and it talks like a duck, it's a duck. Yeah. And by any other name, if we're not doing things that the Bible lays out, that we should show forth godliness in our life and get out of practicing sin, I'm afraid we've been deceived on a short stick. Amen, Pastor. In verses 8 through 11, Jude describes in harsh terms the character and conduct of false teachers. He compares them with three historical figures remembered for ungodly acts and attributes. First was Cain. We know that Cain was the natural man having his own way. There was Balaam, making merchandise, if you will, uh, of other type of a gospel. And then there was Korah, denying the authority of Moses as the spokesman uh, for God himself. Let me give you two more minutes. Two, four, six, eight, ten. Good. Got about 15 more minutes then. I'm going to hurry seriously. In verses 12 through 13, there are six metaphors describing these apostate teachers. Spots. They're hidden rocks in love feasts referring to the Lord's table. If you can imagine yourself on a, on a ship going down the road, down, down, going down the, through the, the, the lake, and there's hidden rocks there, and your ship hits it, what's going to happen? He said that's what these apostate teachers are like. They're like hidden rocks. You don't see them, 
but you better learn how to navigate around them. And feeding themselves, false shepherds feed their own desires without fear. There's a lot of pastors, they don't feed the sheep, they shear the sheep. Yeah. And then clouds without water, describing false promises that apostates make. Then he talks about trees without fruit. It describes how barren professing apostates are. Raging waves of the sea, describing wasted efforts of the apostasy. And then wandering stars, describing the aimless pur purpose of false teaching. Again, Enoch said what? Coming destruction. Enoch predicted the second coming of Christ before the Lord came the first time. And Enoch announced two great events. The Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints. And he comes to execute judgment upon all that are ungodly. Again, do you see how Jude and 2 Peter 2 correlate together? Peter said these guys are coming... When Jude desired to write his little epistle, he wanted to write about a common salvation. He wanted to brag on Jesus. But he opened his eyes and saw what was going on in the church. And whoa, somebody better address this. Somebody better address this. And that's what he did. A whole lot more I could say. We could talk about how to contend for the faith. Apostasy has been foretold. Apostasy has been warned. We're to build ourselves up in faith Pray, keep ourselves in God's love, look to the Lord Jesus Christ, and win the lost at any cost. More to say, but let me close with this. The closing doxology of Jude is one of the most beautiful statements you'll find in the entirety of God's Word. Now to him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion, power, both now and forever. Amen.